Welcome to another GCN Tech Clinic where Ollie and I answer the questions that you've submitted using the hashtag AskGCNTech. Well, and this week you've got me. So let's make a start with our first question, which comes from Finley Watson, who asks, how do you know when the braking surface on rim brake wheels needs replacing? And do you need a whole new wheel set or can you just replace the braking surface on the rim itself? Well, that's a good question, and quite a lot of rim brakes do have a specific wear indicator on the braking surface themselves, and that's normally a little dot that's got a bit of coloured paint in it, and, well, as that rim wears down, you just won't be able to see that indicator dot, and that's when the rims need replacing, or the whole wheels. But some wheels don't have that, so you are going to have to assess the wear on the rim just by looking at it, and you can feel it with your fingers as well, and as the rims wear, they'll get a big sort of groove or curve worn into the braking surface, and that's because that material has worn away over time. And if you're unsure whether your wheels need replacing or not because they're worn out, it's best just to head down to your local bike shop and get them to assess it too. And it depends what wheels you've got, because if you've got particularly expensive wheels with fancy hubs, then yeah, maybe it might be getting the, worth getting the rim replaced rather than replacing the whole wheel. But sometimes it can be cheaper just to replace the whole wheel. So there you go. Next up is from Tyler Durden, interesting name. And they're wondering, if GCN only answers five tech questions a week, the backlog must be over 300,000 by now. Well, thanks for that. And you're lucky to make it in here because, well, I can see here, you didn't actually use the hashtag AskGCNTech, so you've done well to slide into the list. Um, but actually, I think you'll find it's way more than 300,000 by now. But Ollie has assured me he's got a little bit of spare time over Christmas and he's going to work his way through nearly all of them. So fingers crossed on that one. Our next question is in from Kai, and they ask, why don't we see integrated lights on the seat posts and head tubes or bars on high-end bikes? Well, that's a good question, and well, it is something that we already see. There are many bikes out there, such as brands such as Canyon and Orbea, Bay, already incorporate lights into the seat posts and handlebars of their bikes on some of their sort of commuter bike ranges because, well, that's where it's most effective. But some brands don't do this because, well, it gives you the choice to choose between the thousands of different light options out there, which are suitable for lots of different purposes, be that commuting or riding off road, and depending on how long you want the light to last. So that's probably why. The next question is from Joseph B. And they ask, can we talk about the advantages and disadvantages of having different wheel depths in the front and back of your bike, sort of the deep section aero wheels that we quite often see, and how does a different combination fare in crosswinds, flats, or heels, heels versus the um, wheels of the same rim depths? So quite an involved question. There's a few different answers that I've gone through here. Um, and it's a good question, so thanks for submitting that. But generally, the different wheel depths refer to how aerodynamic or lighter wheel is. It tends to be the shallower wheel rims are obviously a bit lighter because there's less materials there, and the deeper wheel rims are more aerodynamic, and that's why they've got that shape to them, but then they are a little bit heavier. And we tend to see types of riders favour the wheels depending on what they sort of specialise in. We'll see many GC or climbing riders favour the shallower wheels for their lightweight characteristics, whereas the sort of time trialists or sprint riders maybe would use a more a far deeper rim that's more aerodynamic because, well, they're all about going super fast on the flats. Sometimes we do see riders combine a shallower wheel at the front and a deeper one at the back. And the reasoning behind that is just because when you're in a crosswind situation, the wind's blowing from the side of the bike, the front wheel is far less affected by that wind because the wheel is a lot shallower, therefore there's less surface for the winds to hit. And on the back of the bike, it doesn't really tend to have quite such a significant impact because, well, obviously you steer at the front of the bike. So that, that tends to be why we see those. Um, and it is, it's very uncommon to see a deeper wheel in the front and a shallow wheel at the back. No one ever tends to use that because, like I just said, it's the front wheel that's affected by the crosswinds, so that'll be why you tend to use a shallower wheel in the front. I hope that clears up, but there are a lot of different variations to this question, so we could talk about it forever, but it gives you a brief summary of it. And our next question that's been submitted is from Kimberly Sparkles, good name. And they're asking, how do you figure out why your bike is squeaking? And it's a bit of a tricky one to answer that because we haven't got a vast amount of information, but my best advice is to try and isolate where the squeak is coming from, so sort of try out different components rather than trying to look at the bike as a whole. Try and see where that noise is coming from and then limit it down to one or two components. And you can always try to assess whether the squeak is changing if it gets louder, the faster you pedal or the faster you ride, because if 
the faster you pedal changes the noise of the squeak, then chances are it's something to do with your drivetrain rather than maybe the wheels, for example. Um, so try and isolate that noise and then you can pinpoint it out. But sometimes it's components that you're just not really expecting it to be. It was only last week that I had an annoying squeak on my bike and it turned out to be one of the pulley wheels which just was a five minute job, take it out, a bit of fresh grease and it was ready to go again. And our next question is a very interesting one, um, which they say, can they lube their bike with butter or beef fat? Well, absolutely not, neither of those are acceptable. Bike chain lubes only, I'm afraid, so yeah, cancel that. Um, next in, we've got Jonathan NG who asks, how do I remove branding from my road bike frame? It says it's carbon fiber. Um, without damaging the frame or also the paint. Um, also, could you tell us how to do it with other materials such as aluminium or titanium? That's an interesting question and I'm not really sure why you would want to remove the logos from your bike, but each to their own I suppose. And there's going to be a few different ways you can do this depending on how your bike has been painted. If you're fortunate enough that the logos are just placed on the top of the paintwork as a sticker, then it's pretty simple. You can just warm the stickers up with a hot air gun or a hairdryer to loosen the glue slightly and then carefully peel them off and use a suitable um, solvent or solution to sort of wash off the remaining glue and then you have a perfectly logo free bike. But if the logo is underneath the clear coat of lacquer on the frame, well it's going to be a fair bit of a more involved job to do because you can have to sand down that top layer of lacquer and then you can get to the stickers and then peel them off again. But by doing that, you do run the risk of damaging the paintwork and it's quite an involved process. So I'd probably avoid trying to de-logo the bike if it's underneath the lacquer and the clear coat because, well, you don't want to risk doing it. And that's going to be the same for aluminium and steel frames as well. It just depends how the bike has been painted. So I hope that clears that one up for you. Our final question this week is from Andrew T and he asks, do we have any tips on how to install Shimano direct mount brakes, for example, BR5800 brakes? He's struggling to use the plastic assembly tool that Shimano provide and saying it's tricky to align the bolts on the caliper and with the threads in the frame. The plastic template seems to remove itself when he starts tightening the bolts before he can sufficiently get enough of the bolt threaded in to keep the caliper in place. And it's a good question and it's a problem that now and again I have when I'm trying to fit direct mount brakes because they are a little bit tricky. And my best bit of advice is to try and use the tool that's provided with it as well because that will help you out a little bit although you are still struggling. Make sure the threads on the frame are nice and clear and free of any debris because that's going to mean the bolts are going to guide in nice and easy first off. Um, and a trick that I find helps most is I get one side of the brake threaded into the frame a little bit, maybe a turn or so, and that's enough to hold that one side in place. And once that is secured, you can then move across with your free hand to line the other side up correctly and then carefully thread that in. And it is important to be careful when lining these bolts up because it's super easy to cross thread them and you definitely don't want that or you could be ruining a particularly good frame. And once you've got that threaded in place, it's important to talk the bolts up correctly to the manufacturer's specifications to make sure they're nice and secure. So that finishes another GCN Tech Clinic. I hope you enjoyed this one. And as always, keep the questions coming in the comments section down below using the hashtag AskGCNTech. Thanks very much.